We're going to go to the Bible this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I think we'd do well to read as a congregation, verses 1 through 7. Put us back in context of the overall uh, scope of what we've covered so far. We've gotten through verse 5, which is what we focused on last week. We'll read verses 1 through 7. We'll go, Lord, in prayer and get into the message this morning. Let's begin there in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading out loud with me. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verses 5 through 7, I take as a block in most Bibles, well, not most, in some Bibles, there's a kind of a paragraph break between verse 6 and verse 7. Uh, however, I think contextually, verse 6, uh, excuse me, verse 7 fits well with verse 6. But in the block of verses 5 through 7, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake, spent really the last service to focus the fact that this place needs to be about Jesus. This preaching of this church needs to be about Christ. And I believe that God will let this light shine as long as we do really what Pastor Phil has been commending us to do in Revelation series is to keep our first love the first love, and that is Jesus Christ. Keep our focus on him. Keep the fire burning to loving him uh, with all that we have and all that we are. But we don't come together today to hear a news article of what's going on in the world, to hear the latest thing, we come to hear about the Lord. And we do know that the Lord, when he gives us his word, it has an application in the world around us. But we come to see what his word has to say. So we preach Christ and we preach him as Lord and our servants for Jesus' sake. And that idea of being a servant for Jesus' sake is that that is what his disciples look like. His disciples look like servants. And that's something that we want to take on as a church family, that we are servants looking to how to magnify Christ in the world around us. For God, in verse 6, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There's a lot happening in verse 6. I'm going to say that when it gives us this phrase, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, it's doing so in a couple different figuratives. So I believe it's my take anyway that this is a reference to the power of God in creation. So it, to me, it, it harkens back all the way to Genesis chapter 1, where I'm going to read for us verses 1 through 3. So when it says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, praise be to God who is the creator of all, the one who made all things, the one to whom all glory belongs because he is the one who made everything. In Genesis 1, we read, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And all God's people said, is it so that God created everything? Is that a question as far as the, uh, theology is concerned? No, it is a question as far as mankind is concerned, right? There have been alternative interpretations of those things. By the way, you can search it out yourself. I can't validate whether they're a great organization or not. I've come across a, an organization called John 1010 Project. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. They do great work on magnifying God as a creator, doing uh, studies on creatures. And I just think it's a great thing. And I, I've even gone to this. Some of you have seen it as well. There are uh, some videos out there where they'll do features. Um, our, our kids are pretty well trained. Anytime they, they hear millions of years, they will immediately pipe up. 
and say, blah, 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 or something like that, you know? Uh, they will immediately, uh, this is what I think is funny, is that you can have an evolutionist get into the intricacy of animals and creatures, and they may not give God glory, but we can. Because they may not believe in the creator, but we do. And we know the majesty of God in his creation. What, what, is, what is incredible is that you still, in any, any type of study, when you're looking at the origins or the beginnings of life, science cannot explain it. There still is a huge leap of faith. Our leap of faith is not really, I don't, I don't consider it a strain at all. We believe there's a God who created all. And, and there is no way in the world you have any of what this is. We just did a study on whales. Um, and we learned that evolutionists, you know where, do you know where evolutionists say whales came from? Besides, uh, we're going past the, the Big Bang and the goop and all that, right? They say that whales came from land animals like a dog that went back into the water. And over time, and over time, whale. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the truth being so clear to you that you can laugh at the crazy theories of man. It is a wonderful thing to come. And this is why church matters. You get to come together around God's word, give God glory for what he has done and rejoice in like mind and faith. And how refreshing that is when you're in a world that chooses not to glorify God in this nature. So where we're going in this passage is in verse two of Second Corinthians, oh, excuse me, Genesis one, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And here it is. And God said, you know what? And God said, let there be light. And then how's it finished? And there was light. Isn't that an amazing God? It's, 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 it is it's too light of speech to say, but it's the coolest thing in the world to know that you've got a God who makes things by speaking. It, it is astounding. And by the way, let me just translate that to our future as Christians. If God can speak the world into existence, and if God can speak and make light happen, if he can do all of that, is it any stretch for him to give you a glorified body? Is it any stretch for him to take bodies that are disintegrated and, and in the oceans or in the graves or been cremated? Is it, any, is it any stretch for God to be able to, from that, give a glorified body? It isn't because he is who he declares himself to be. So he is a God with power. So in... Second Corinthians chapter four, we have this reference for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. I think it at least is a figurative reference to the power of God in giving light. More directly though, the context of the passage we've already read where it was in verse four, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So it is more directly in context in 2 Corinthians 4, pointing to the sending of light into the world, specifically the gospel light. Now from that, this is where we're going to jump into several other passages to look at the light that God has given to a world that is in darkness. So take your Bibles to Luke chapter one, and we're gonna look at verses 76 through 79. And this is Zechariah's, uh, Zechariah's prayer regarding uh, the announcement or the, his son, John the Baptist. Excuse me, uh, giving a prophecy of John the Baptist, all right? So Zechariah uh, is who we're referencing in Luke chapter one, verses 76 
through 79. Again, referencing what John the Baptist would do. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This prophet, John the Baptist, would come and he would declare the way of the Lord. He would declare the person of the Lord. You might remember back in John 1 where John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, Behold, what does he say? The Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Light has come into the world. In this reference of 2 Corinthians 4, the light to shine out of the darkness is a direct reference to the light of the gospel that has come into the world to reach every person that would be saved. The way it says it in verse 78 of Luke 1, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness. It also then references the shadow of death. God's grace and his mercy is that he shines that light of hope to you. Now, I don't think you can truly appreciate this unless you can put yourself into a context of being lost. And not only lost, but lost in the darkness. So I have a question. Have you ever been lost? Now this actually, I'm not going to steal everything from Vacation Bible School, but this is one of our days that we're going to focus on a Vacation Bible School. The idea of being lost. You ever been lost in the woods? Have you, raise your hand if you've ever been lost in the woods. Well, apparently you got found because look at you. (laughs) Okay. So I I had never really experienced it. I, I am going to steal a little bit of it. So maybe I'll tell a bit. Um, most young people would be in VBS or not in here anyway. So back in the days when the GPS was being introduced into the sportsman's world as a navigation tool, I had a friend that I was hunting with and he had brought his newfangled GPS. And he was, and of course, back in the day, you're in the woods he'd have to hold it up and and walk around like this and trying to get a signal. Well, his name's John. And I remember looking at him like, you box of rocks, you don't need that. The vehicle is right up there. You don't need your GPS to find it. And and while, while he's walking circles looking for his signal, I took off to go to the vehicle. Well... That was the first time in my, in my life that I had ever gotten lost in the woods. And here's how I knew I was lost. I, I did not ever believe that this could ever happen to me. I did a complete circle. And the way I knew I did a complete circle is there was a tree and a little bit of a clearing that had a big orange X on it. And I, I took note when I left there's the tree. All right, I'm going to leave from here. The truck's up there. Somehow I did a circle. I came back to that tree. And let me tell you, I really didn't feel like hugging that tree. (laughs) I went, "Uh uh-oh. And John was nowhere to be found. Now, the truck was way up there, but his four-wheeler was a little closer. He had made his back to his four-wheeler. And so I heard off in the distance, ee, ee of his four-wheeler, and I went, he's made it all the way back there. I I ran so fast to make him think that I wasn't really lost. (laughs) And I ran to the sound of that four-wheeler. The point is, being lost is one thing, but being lost in the dark is a different experience. Now, I have had the experience as well in the mountains of Idaho, coming off the mountain many times in the dark. And 
Imagine your headlamp goes out. Have you ever tried to change batteries in a headlamp in the dark <laughs> with no moon? No moon in the dark, headlamps out, that is unnerving. But especially if you don't know where you are. Now, the truth of it is, in VBS, we're going to make this illustration, but the truth is, people die. People die in circumstances like this in the wild. The scriptural illustration is that this is where the world is. The world is in darkness, grappling around and kind of, and what does it look like? Well, it honestly looks like some people walking through the woods in the dark. You know what, you know what happens when you walk through the woods in the dark without light? Even with a headlamp, you know what happens? You get smacked in the face by all kinds of branches and brush. It is, it is an exciting adventure. <laughs> and these are things that I usually don't talk about with my wife present. <laughs> and she's not here. So I'll find out if she watched online later. <laughs> you did what? And that's when I usually blame Settler or Jason Sprague or somebody like that. Is there, or Casey, it was your fault. Um, the, world is, the world is being smacked in the face by its own repercussion of being blind in the world and trying to make it up as it goes. But God in his grace and his mercy has shined his light into that darkness so that as we are sitting here in darkness, we can have direction and hope. Take your Bibles to John 12. John 12. John 12, verses 44 through 50. <laughs> Pastor Phil, we have got to get a system. I never remember once I opened my bottle which one it was. <laughs> Love you, brother. <laughs> Hope that was mine. <laughs> John 12, 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me, say it, should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to do what? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him, and there it is, folks, in the last day. There is a day of reckoning. Everybody needs to be saved. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I, know, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So we reference, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. It is the Father's plan that a Savior would come into the world. It is the Father's plan that there would be hope in this world of a Messiah who could redeem anyone that would turn to him. It says, has shined in our hearts to give, in 2 Corinthians 6, 4 verse 6, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We're going to unpack that a little bit. And it says, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You can know the glory of God through his son. God has given light to this dark world. He has given light to all. John chapter one, longer section, but if you'll go to John chapter one. John chapter one. So God has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The glory of God is in the light that he has sent of the gospel. The glory of God is revealed there. It is, we reference that in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 where Paul references that the gospel is the power of God. It is how God has made a way. And hear what I'm going to say. I usually make this reference on Resurrection Sunday and I might do it again. 
But the most powerful force on this planet is death. Everything succumbs to it. Everything is going to yield to its power. Anybody that can overcome that is truly God. And so the resurrection life of Christ is the testimony that God is truly all powerful and the one who is truly God. But that God has sent hope into this world through the light of Jesus Christ, where we read in John chapter one, I'm going to read it for us and for sake of time, but you know this passage, many of you, some of you memorized largely this section. In the beginning, verse one, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines Shineth in darkness, and the darkness did what? Comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We just referenced him in Luke. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him, what? Might believe. So never underestimate the power of the gospel, of the power of of God's desire. He wants all men to be saved. It is God's desire that everyone would come to repentance and come to faith in the gospel and the knowledge of his son. So that light came into the world. uh, Excuse me, in verse 7, John bore witness of that light to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, referencing John, but was sent to bear witness of that light, verse 9, that was the true light, and here is the phrase, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, there is a false doctrine of universalism built on this verse and uh, some others that would say, well, the light has shined unto everyone, and and therefore everybody's going to be saved. However, you already have in verse 7 a refutal of of that point. Who is the narrow group that is saved? Who is it on verse 7? On those that might believe. All right? So, yes, the light has come into the world to shine into this darkness so that people could be rescued. But it it is for all people to receive that message. And you are not insulated from that message this morning. Now, I know this. I can convince no one to be saved. And I want to tell you, it's actually, I don't think, necessarily my job to do so. I do believe in the power of God and the power of his word. And he's given much truth right here this morning to say that there is a day of reckoning. There is a day of accountability. And he has shined into your heart the knowledge of God. He has shined into your heart to say there's every reason, every reason for you, first of all, to know that there is a God. And upon that knowledge to seek him. And the Bible tells us that he will reward everyone that seeks him. And those that seek him will find him. And that light has come as an invitation to every last soul in this world that would turn to Christ. If you would do that, he says, that light then becomes yours. Well, let's read further. Again, coming back into verse 10. He was in the world. (coughs) And listen to this. This Jesus, the world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came into his own. His own received him not. You know, many of you, verse 12, have memorized it. If you've got it memorized, would you read it or quote it? But as many as received him. There it is again. Even to those that believe on his name. Verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh nor the will of man, but of God. God wants to be your savior. Amen? Now, sometimes you have to have a dramatic thing to make you aware of your need. Can God do that? I'm gonna tell you, it is worth God breaking your body for you to come to him. It is worth God having you go through the darkest of places to magnify the darkness so that you would understand that you need a savior. Just two days ago, I got a message from someone who I've known for years, known him from Danville, Illinois. And they said, Pastor Jeff, I just want you to know that I have been saved. Uh, the other day, I went through a dark place in my life. And I missed taking my life by, I think he said, six inches. 
So we actually, the, uh, the shot was fired. Uh, I don't know all the details. He went through all that place. And he went r- really through a dark, dark place. Now listen, I know this person from about 25 years ago when they were in church. Coming to church isn't going to save anybody. Sitting your person in that chair week after week will not save your soul. Being a good person and doing all the stuff isn't going to rescue you. You have got to have Jesus. Now the invitation of that light has come unto everybody. Now is light always a friendly thing? Well, I happen to have in my mind turning the light on in my children in the dark when either we're getting them up or maybe they've just, any any other parents do this? Your kids have gone to bed. They're now in bed. The lights are out. Maybe mom did it or whatever. The lights are out. You don't know. You come in, you turn the light on. You aren't exactly greeted with warm, joy, blessed father things. (laughs) You generally see this squirmy face. Ah, the light. Well, that is how the world responds to the light that shows the truth of the gospel, but that light is the rescue of your soul. You have a decision of whether you will respond to Jesus or not. I thank the Lord. Now, it's, it, just listen to this, folks. By the testimony of this friend of mine, when I knew him, I was a youth pastor. He was in the church where I was a youth pastor. I know the church faithfully teaching and preaching the gospel. And I don't know the whole story, but I do know that alcohol got involved. And you know what? That is so not uncommon for people who are attending church and don't really have a relationship with Jesus. Because you're looking for something else, something else, something else to to satisfy or give you something. And here's the thing. Everything that the world offers, it has a hook. And as a destroyer, nothing, no one can save like Jesus. Think about this, six inch difference from that man spending eternity in hell and God rescuing him so that he could be saved. Six inches in a moment. It's the second story in one week. Another was a young lady. who gives a story of lying in in a bathtub with a razor in hand and just before going through with it, God in his grace reaches into that life and spares them from that decision to where they are gloriously saved. Such a razor's edge to being eternally lost. If you're not saved this morning, you're on that razor's edge. I'm going to tell you, listen to me, you can die without a moment's notice. Some of you think that maybe dying will be like being in an airplane where you're going to crash. You've got time to call out. You don't always have time. If you die without Christ, you will die doomed. And this message will be at least one message that I think will haunt you where the invitation of the gospel came to your door, came to your heart. And here's, here it is, folks. This group of people who knows Christ, loves you, wants you to be saved, but nobody can do it for you. And God by design wants you to love him, for you to make a decision for him. John chapter 14, a passage you know, the light is the the knowledge of the glory of God. You can know the glory of God's power in the gospel through his son. You know the passage well. It starts in verse six. We're gonna go through verse 11.
John 14, I'm going to have you engage with me. Read verses 6 through 11 out loud with me. John 14, verse 6, going through 11. Let's begin together. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. This last week, I watched a guy, and I don't know who he is, he's an atheist. He has a cup, a glass, kind of like beaker, not really. Yeah. It's, it's like a chemistry cup and he's got in it about, it's about this tall, about that big around and, he, and the very bottom of it, maybe, maybe an inch or so, he's got some orange, uh, orange drink in there, orange something in there. And he goes through this denial of Christ saying, out of all the knowledge there is to know, I have this much reason to believe in the Jesus of the Bible and his resurrection. He said, now, if you talk to a believer, someone who's a believer, they're gonna magnify that inch and they're gonna say, well, that really is taking up three quarters of the cup or maybe all the cup. But as I see it, all the evidence that we have, it only takes up this much. And here's what you have. You have man saying that what you've done, Lord, is not enough to satisfy me. All I can say again is that God has given evidence not only of his creation, but Jesus gave in his grace sufficient evidence of who he is and what he has done. I I reference here that last verse, verse 11. Uh, I don't know that I can read exasperation in the Lord's voice, but when Philip says, show us the Father and it suffices us, you hear, you hear that phrase right there in verse nine, have I been so long time with you and you still don't believe? You still don't acknowledge who I am? So what does Jesus do? He says, you've heard my words, but he says, if you don't believe me for any other reason, look at the works I have done. There's every reason to believe in this Jesus. This last Tuesday night, are there, are, there, uh, are there a plethora of things you could believe in? Sure. And please believe me, I'm not picking on anybody if they're Catholic in this room. But this last Tuesday night, I showed a video of Pope Francis praying to Mary and asking Mary to intercede and asking Mary to do various things. I want to tell you, folks, outside of her testimony in scripture, Mary can do nothing to save anybody's soul. And we love Mary, the mother of Jesus. There are people that believe in Muhammad, people that believe in Joseph Smith. None of these or others are the Jesus of the Bible. The resurrected Savior who in his life did the works to prove who he is. So what it comes down to is someone saying, yeah, I don't believe. That may be your, your place, but it's a horrible place to be with eternal, heavy consequences. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six, the light is the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now I'm gonna tell you what I believe here. When it says in the face of Jesus Christ, what I believe is that this is a hearkening back to the illustration that we just had of Moses. That's my view. 
So you remember in the previous chapter how that Moses, when he got the commandments from God, came down from the mountain and his face shined with the glory of God. That, that shining was temporary because Moses would die and that glory of being with the Father shining in his face, that would cease. But when it talks about it here in this passage, in the face of Jesus Christ, I believe it is a reference that when you look at Jesus, you are seeing the Father. When you are looking at Jesus, you are seeing the light of the world who is the flashlight in the darkness to rescue your soul. It is through Jesus that you recognize the glory of God. It is through Jesus that you recognize. I, I heard another testimony this last week of someone saying the proverbial, they said they had a, a God-sized hole in their heart that only God could fill. Praise God for their testimony where they came to Christ. The point of this passage, if we come back to it, verses five and six, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. The servanthood that we offer you to hear, here in this place this morning is to point to this Jesus, who is the Savior recognized as the light of the world, verse six, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You want to be saved? This, I believe you could look at that verse and that is very much a John 14, six verse. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now there's all that message and all this morning has really been about Jesus, the light of the world, that glorious message. All right. Have you ever had something in your life that was really valuable to you? That you wanted to protect? I don't know what that might be. Um, first of all, have you ever had anything break like that? Or lose something like that? When you were trying to, to protect it? If you're trying to protect something really valuable, um, what measures would you take? What measures would you take? There have been times in my family where I've had to have one of my kids help me take something and, or to carry something for me. And I didn't know which child I was going to get that came to me. It was usually what we call the beller of dad. And kids come and I've got something for someone to carry. And then maybe it's one of the little people and I've got something that when I look at that child, I go, hmm, should I really be giving this to them to do this for me? When you want to protect something, you take every measure you can, right? There may be a lot of security, a lot of, a lot of whatever that goes into it. This is an interesting thing to me in that in verse seven, the most glorious message that has ever been given is the message that we just got done declaring that Jesus is the light of the world, the savior of the world, who can rescue a soul eternally. That is the most powerful message in the world. Now, let's read 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 out loud. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, would you read it with me? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. All right, let's unpack it for a moment. We have this, as it says here, we have this, what's the next word? Treasure. Is the gospel a treasure? I don't know how we can unpack that and magnify that to the degree that's worthy. It is the most valuable thing that man could ever have. So how do you give God glory over this treasure at this moment? Uh, give God glory for the treasure of the gospel that's come to you. But that treasure is held in what is called here an earthen vessel. So what is an earthen vessel? Some of you have it in your, in your commentary. Some of your Bible translations will say it this way. Do you know what an earthen vessel is? Literally an earthen vessel? Now this is figurative, but an earthen vessel is, some of you already have it, it is a clay pot. So what are clay pots known for? Especially if you're Pastor Phil. You might remember, 
that he shared a snippet of his demented character that when he goes into a pot, a plant place and there are all these pots that he's tempted to maybe break one or two. <laughs> I'm tempted to shoot them, but, um, <clears throat> cause they, okay. Um, what are they known for? They're known for not enduring. They're known for breaking. They're known for, for fragility. Clay, po clay pots are not typically the type of thing that you're going to pass on as a family heirloom. Because they typically aren't going to simply last that long. And even if they did last, they are going to be broken and have hairline cracks. Matter of fact, there's something that we don't necessarily use clay pots so much. There's an avenue in which we do. We have something else that we use instead of clay. What do we use? Plastic. Anybody else seem to be replacing your water pots almost every year that you use outside or every other year because they wind up developing a leak somewhere? It's that kind of thing. It's the fragile nature of that pot. Now, what's that pot doing? It is simply a vessel to carry one important thing or something of importance to another place. And we, by this figure, are the clay pots and by this figure, we're the clay pots holding this treasure. So this, I'm, I'm gonna make a statement again. I, I don't, I, on my life, I don't know how you get around it. No matter what humility we have, it isn't enough. We could not be humble enough. <laughs> we have no power to the redeeming of our souls. We have no power to the redeeming of anyone else. All we can do as, as an individual is place our faith in the one who can save. And when we do, God, and this is just such a wonderful thing about the Lord. When you do what John 1, 12 says, believe on Jesus Christ and he makes you a child of God. He doesn't just make you a child of God. He makes you a vessel to carry his message. Every one of you, every one of you, every one in this room who knows Jesus is by definition, by what Jesus says, you are a disciple of Christ. And by the doctrine of this passage, you hold the most glorious message on the planet in your person. We could take a lot of time on the illustrations here, but what's the illustration of a vessel? A vessel is going to carry something and a vessel usually isn't meant simply to carry something. A vessel is meant to carry something and then at some point at the end of its journey to give up what it carried. Is that fair? Is that a fair statement? So in the mornings when I, one of the things I like to do this time of year, time of year I've got a jerry-rigged little uh, bird bath that I, I have in the backyard. I get water from the sink and I go dump the old water and pour new water in there. That vessel is good if it carries the water and gets it where the water can do what it's supposed to do. It's not a good vessel if I fill it and it never goes to do what I gave it to do or it leaks it all out without doing its intended purpose. That stuff has to get out where it's supposed to go. So I got a question for you. What are you carrying? Well, as a believer, you're carrying the gospel. So I got another question for you. Where is it supposed to go? Where is it supposed to go? And you have to answer that, but I think I would answer it the same way I, I'm hearing some of you. It's got to make its way to the lost. It's got to make it to the person who is in darkness. Now, you're not responsible for how somebody responds to that. John chapter three, verses 19 through 21 gives a reference to the lost not appreciating the light. Actually hating the light. But I want you to remember something this morning. You and I need to be careful about withholding the gospel for fear of how somebody's gonna respond. And here's why. God still saves people. He's still saving people now. 
Now, I'm blessed. Pastor Phil's blessed. Um, we, we get to be pastors here, and we get to proclaim the truth. But I want to tell you that you may be the preacher next door. You may be the preacher in your workplace. You may be the preacher to your neighborhood. You may be the one. They may never know me. Matter of fact, I just want to give a testimony here. I, I didn't understand this when I was first saved. I used to be a little bit irritated because uh, when I got saved, uh, appropriately, I wanted everybody in my family to be saved. I want, and, and all my friends, I want everybody to be saved. I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor Neil, would you come to my house and would you give the message of the gospel to my family? And Pastor Neil was, of course, willing. And, uh, but, you know, kind of time went on. Ministry's busy and he didn't make it over. I come next Sunday. Pastor Neil, when, when can you come tell my family the gospel message? And, and, and I, I, poor man, I pestered him. I'm, I'm sure I put a spiritual guilt trip on him every Sunday. And it got to being a month and then two months and still. And I don't remember at some point he came and it wasn't what I thought. I'm like, uh, he, was, he was supposed to like give him the gospel and they're all supposed to sit down and, and receive it. And it was all going to happen right there. It never did happen that way. It never did. And what I realized as I grew as a believer is that I may be the messenger. And I'm not responsible for everyone getting saved. But I also want to tell you this. There was another step in my, in my growth as well. And that is learning to lead with the gospel from a disposition of loving people. And what I mean by that is that it's that age old adage. People don't really care how much you know to the new hunch, how much you care. And really what happens is we have to love people, be faithful to tell the truth, and let God do his work. So what that means is, truth tellers in this room, is that you and I need to be committed to the truth of the Bible and of the gospel, whatever it is. And is it true that the world is denying the truth of the Bible today? Pick your category, right? In so many ways. But as a Bible believer, I want to encourage you with the power of the gospel and with the personal stewardship of carrying that message. You and I can partner together in this way this morning. And I think it'd be appropriate as we close. Let's pray for people to be saved. Fair? And let's plan to give what is in this vessel out. Let's give it in a disposition of love, in a disposition of grace. But let's get this message that is in us out to the world. The light has already come. We just need to point people to that light. And the world, listen, the world is a mess. And then I think we could all argue that the darkness is great. But what do we know about the darkness being great? Where the darkness is great, the light shines that much brighter. So we are in the best place that we could be on this planet in a time where we can tell people about Christ. Now, here's how it's going to go. This service, it's 12 o'clock. And by our standards, we're going to get done early. <laughs> this message is going to be done. You're going to leave this place. All right? You're going to leave this place. And I'm right here with you. Lord, would you help me speak Jesus in the world around me this week? Would you help me not only just to have the opportunity, but to seize the day and tell somebody about you? Now, maybe that's going to be person to person. Maybe it's going to be a letter or a card or whatever. But I think we should partner together for the gospel's sake. Pray and ask the Lord how we can get this message in this earthen vessel out to the world around us. We're actually going to pick up next week. We're actually going to take a break next week. When we come back, we're going to hit verse seven briefly again and talk a little bit more about that earth and vessel. But then you're going to see the ministry or the title of this series, the idea of hindrance and help or hindrance and hope that there are hindrances that we face. 
But we have the God of all who gives us grace to do what he's called us to do. You leave this place today with the power of God and the power of his message and by God's grace, let's pray to see people saved.